So here we go. In three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, September 16th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely or in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating. Remote participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's equity committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fass, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. <clears throat> Hager. Present. Ms. Mack. Present. Ms. Pastor. Present. Mr. Thomas. Present. Thank you. Ms. Fess, could you also call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Dr. McComas. Present. Dr. Yarborough. Present. Mr. Handy. Present. Thank you. Are there any other staff members participating that we did not call? This is Melissa Wisted. I'm participating. And Mr. Kearns. Mr. Kearns. Hi, I'm Mr. Kearns, a coordinator for advanced academics. And we also have Dr. Holmes on as well. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Holmes, Senior Executive Director for Curriculum and Instruction. Thank you. Are there any board members who have joined us who um, we didn't call? I don't see anyone. OK. Thank you. All right. Great. So then our first item on the agenda is gifted and talent and talented. And first is a presentation on gifted and talented. Dr. Wisted and Mr. Kearns will present. Yes. Um, good evening or late afternoon. Mr. Kearns and I are here to present. I know this came up um, in a previous meeting based on some information that Mr. Kearns had shared at the GTCAC meeting in the spring um, and so he's really going to take the lead with the presentation but we'll be here for questions after he presents. Great and I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to be here to talk uh, with you a little bit about equitable representation in uh, advanced academics and GT programs and services. Uh, so Mr. Corns, I think uh, are you going to advance through the slides is that correct? Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so I want, first of all, for us to just recognize as we talk about equity and advanced academics and GT programs and services that this discussion is grounded in our board policy 0100 regarding equity. And in addition to that, uh, it is grounded in the compass focus area one key initiative three, which specifically talks about some of the inequities that exist currently exist in Baltimore County Public Schools in regard to participation in advanced academics and GT 
ICT programs and services. Uh, the next slide uh, has some information as well about uh, policy 6401. Uh, we do have a board policy and a superintendent's rule governing gifted and talented and advanced academics in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, and while, of course, the policy is more extensive than what's on the screen at the moment, uh, for our purposes today, I thought it was important for us to understand how our policy defines advanced or gifted students. So in our policy, advanced or gifted students are defined as those students who have outstanding talent and who perform or who show the potential for performing at remarkably high levels of accomplishment when compared with other students of a similar age, experience, or environment in intellectual, creative, artistic, or specific academic fields. So I want uh, to mention this definition at the beginning of the presentation, because as we go through and we talk about uh, some of the issues surrounding equitable identification, uh, this definition becomes uh, really critical to understand and important to our understanding of potential solutions to the problem. Uh, our next slide um, just defines for us what we mean when we say uh, equity in uh, advanced academics. Um, so the definition that we're using when we talk about that uh, is uh, something like the, the ratio of any student group in the GT population is approximately equal to the ratio of that student group in the total school population. So when we talk about equity, that's what we mean. We would expect these two ratios to be approximately equal. It would be rare for them to literally be exactly numerically the same, but we would certainly expect them to be close to being the same. Uh, our next slide uh, details what I'm calling half of our system's data story in relationship to GT identification. And this half of the story uh, is a comparison of those two ratios we just talked about in the definition of equity. So if we had equitable identification in Baltimore County Public Schools for advanced and GT programs and services, we would expect these two bars on this graph to be roughly equal for each one of these various student groups. Clearly they are not. Uh, so the blue bars on this graph represent the ratio of each student group in the total school population. The orange bar on the graph represents the ratio of each student group in the GT population. So when we go back to what it mentioned in the compass about how some student groups are underrepresented in GT programs and services while others are overrepresented, that's what we see on this graph. What we see on this graph is that uh, particular student groups, um, specifically Asian and white students, are overrepresented in our GT programs and services uh, while other student groups are underrepresented. So, for our purposes today, I want to just focus for a moment just on our black or African American numbers. So uh, in our total school population, our uh, black students are approximately 41% of the total school population. And they're only 30% of our GT population. So there's about an 11% discrepancy. When we look at these discrepancies on this slide, um, it seems as if the answer to this or the solution to this problem is obvious. And that is, we simply need to identify more students. So I want to, in the next slide, sort of explore that idea just a little bit and unpack that idea just a little bit. So I want us to think through sort of a, uh, what I would call a mathematical interlude. So for our purposes, let's suppose that the total school population, or I'm sorry, excuse me, the total GT population consists of 100 students. Well, we know that our, our black students are 30% of the GT population. So that would mean in this sort of simplified scenario that 30 students are in the GT population are, are black students. So that would give us a ratio of 30 over 100, uh, which would be 30%. So I don't know, Mr. Corns, if you can click through the next couple of clicks, that'll give us that 30% ratio that we see. Now, this is where it seems like the solution is really obvious. If we want to increase the ratio, the 30% number, then all we need to do is increase the number of black students we identify from 30 to 41, and then we've increased the ratio from 30% to 41%. Problem solved. So it seems very simple. Um, and again, Mr. Corns, you can click through just a couple of clicks and it'll show uh, so <laughs> it's my simple animations to go along with this. But the other thing, if you could go back one slide, thank you, Mr. Corns. The, the thing that I want to uh, put forward though, 
is that there is a second way to increase that ratio. And the second way to increase that ratio is not to increase the numerator, but to decrease the denominator. So in other words, if instead of identifying 100 GT students, we identified uh, something along the lines of about 70 or so GT students, that would also increase the ratio of black students uh, within the GT population to approximately 41%. So we need to recognize that there are actually at least two ways to get to the ratio that we would like to see where the ratio of our black students in the total school population is approximately equivalent to the ratio of our black students in the GT population. Uh, one way is to increase the number of black students identified, but the other way is to decrease the total number of students who are identified as GT. And this brings us to the second half of our GT data story, which is the next slide. So this is a graph that details the percentage of each student group in the total school population that is identified as GT. And in addition, we also have the total GT percentage of students identified as GT within the system. So we are currently identifying 42% of our students within the system as gifted and talented or advanced. And you can see for each student group, the percentages of that student group who are identified as GT. And I just want to take a moment for you all to sort of absorb these numbers. And I also want us to think back for a moment to our definition of what we said a GT student is in policy 6401. Uh, there would be any number of ways to paraphrase, paraphrase excuse me, that definition, uh, but one way certainly would be to say that advanced or gifted students are students who perform or have the potential to uh, perform at outstanding levels of achievement when compared to the majority of our students within the system. Uh, again, that would be a paraphrase, but I think it would be a fair paraphrase of that definition. Uh, we are uh, within um, a very close margin of being in the nonsensical position of saying that the majority of our students are performing at outstanding levels compared to the majority of our students. 42% um, of total students being identified as GT is a, an extraordinarily high percentage. Um, most systems within the state of Maryland um, identify fewer than 25% of their students as GT. Many of them identify fewer than 10% of their students as GT. And so this is why I think it's important for us to consider not just the first solution to the problem, which is sort of the intuitive solution. We just need to identify more kids and we've solved our inequity problem. That's why I think we need to think a little bit more deeply and consider the second solution to a potential solution to our inequities. So uh, Mr. Kors, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this Kearns. is just a little bit. Yes, I'm sorry. Is this Mr. where you would like to, to mention some things, Mr. Handy? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No problem, Mr. Kearns, if I may. Um, so really uh, just want to get in here between these two slides that Mr. Kearns is presenting. Um, I would uh, offer some questions for the committee to consider. So Mr. Kearns has offered some, some uh, you know, points for you to ponder. I want to just offer some initial, some additional questions for the committee to consider as you uh, look at the rest of the presentation from Mr. Kearns. Uh, number one, uh, are these data aligned to our student demographics? Okay. Uh, second question, who is missing from these data? Third question, what are the barriers and challenges to changing the data? And I don't want to get too far ahead of, you know, what Mr. Kearns is about to share, but please consider that question. Uh, next question, really a two part question. What is the desired end state and what do we want the data to look like? OK, so just want to offer those questions um, before Mr. Kearns takes you to uh, the next part of this presentation. Thank you. And would Mr. You, Handy, I don't know if it would be possible for you to put those in the chat, but but you. I would love to see them in the chat. It would be very helpful for me anyway, if those were in the chat. Yeah, and, and perhaps for other folks as well. That that would be terrific. Thank you, Mr. Handy. I appreciate that. I'll um, do that. So this uh, 
Thank you very much. Um, so this slide just gives a little bit of background related to um, how we sort of have arrived at this point um, when it comes to GT identification within Baltimore County Public Schools. So if we go back a little bit more than a decade to 2010, uh, about 28% of all BCPS students were identified as GT. So, uh, and at that time, we experienced the same inequitable identification that we are struggling with currently. So this is a persistent problem. Uh, it's, no, it's nothing new. And at that time, a decade or more ago, uh, it seemed that the intuitive solution to that problem was to identify more students. And so approximately a decade ago, perhaps a little bit more, uh, that became uh, the prevailing what would you call it, perhaps philosophy around uh, gifted and talented and advanced academics was this idea that we need to um, uh, provide expanded opportunities, more students uh, identified in order to achieve equity in identification so that those ratios would come into balance. And so over the course of the past decade, uh, we have done that. Um, we have increased the percentage of students. Uh, uh, it's been a 50% increase from 28% to 42%. Um, and so uh, we have identified a great many more students uh, over the course of the past decade uh, than we were identifying prior to that time. However, what we found is that as access to our advanced programs and services and our GT and our AP programs and services has increased, it has not solved the problem of inequitable identification. That problem has persisted. Should a lot more students, but we have not solved the problem of inequitable participation by doing so. So as we've already noted several times, uh, Asian and white students are overrepresented, uh, black, Hispanic, uh, EL, Special education students are underrepresented. Uh, I, actually, the farm uh, data is, uh, is not included on these slides. I apologize. Um, after I went back, I realized that I mentioned farms here, but I don't have that data on the slides. Uh, but farm students are also underidentified uh, compared to their uh, ratio in the general population. So it is our belief that Baltimore County has to figure out a way to use the data that we have differently in our identification procedures if we are to make progress toward equitable identification. And uh, so if you could go to the next slide, Mr. Corns, I want to explain a little bit about what I mean by using data differently. Uh, one of the things that we believe and that uh, the research in gift, the field of gifted education would support is that if we replace using national norms with using school-based norms for GT identification, we will be able to increase the representation of some of those student groups who are currently underrepresented. And so I want to show you a graph that I pulled from a uh, research article that is directly related to the use of school based norms. So um, in 2019, a group of researchers uh, led by Scott Peters and Jonathan Plucker um, ran a research study where they looked at all third grade students from 10 states. So it's a huge sample size and they pulled the third grade map data, the measures of academic progress, which we also use in Baltimore County, they pulled that data in order to create a comparison of uh, how many students or what percentage of students would be identified uh, from racial and ethnic groups. They did not include some of the special area, special groups that uh, we've included in our data like EL students or uh, special education students, but racial and ethnic student groups. And they compared uh, what would the percentages for identification look like if we used national norms, district norms, uh, or, or I'm sorry, national norms, state norms, district norms, or school-based or local norms. A and I should mention that when we say school-based norms, what we mean is a uh, ranked performance uh, within a particular school building. Uh, and so this graph shows for the third grade reading scores, just as an example, of the differences between using those norms. So for example, for African-American students, 
almost 250% more African-American students were identified using school-based norms than using national norms. Uh, you can see the same thing for our Latinx students in this study of, of third graders from 10 states. Uh, over 150% increase in the Latinx students who were identified for GT programs and services using school-based norms compared to using national norms. Uh, the representation among Asian American and European American students goes down when you use school-based norms as opposed to national norms. So this is just an example of the potential impact that school-based norms could have on GT identification within our own school system. I'd like to go to our next slide, Mr. Corns, and I want to explain just a little bit about sort of like what we're looking at as an office and as a system as we move forward in reference to this issue of inequitable identification in GT. First, I think it's important to note that Dr. Williams has taken the lead by establishing a GT Honors AP IB system improvement team that is currently working and has been working over the course of the past year to uh, evaluate and recommend changes to our processes, our curriculum and professional learning related to this issue, specifically this issue of inequitable representation within GT programs and services. So that team is, is currently working uh, we uh, provided an end of year report that I know was shared with the board and uh, we are continuing that work uh, through this school year as well. We are also adding this year uh, cognitive abilities test or the COGAT, uh, which is an abilities assessment and we are adding that to our universal screening process. Uh, you may recall at the uh, end of the year, I think it was at the June board meeting, uh, the board approved the contract uh, for Riverside Insight Publishing, which was for this Cognitive Abilities Assessment. Uh, it will be given to all third grade students uh, from November 27th to, I think it's December 17th is the testing window. So we will have um, this additional data in order to use uh, in our universal screening process. One of the things that we would like to do with that data once we have it, is to evaluate uh, the impact of using school-based norms for GT identification uh, using the COGAD as a screener or as a measure. Uh, so practically speaking, what that would look like is, um, suppose we use school-based norms and we said uh, for each school, uh, we're going to take the top 15% of students uh, who's in terms of their score on COGAD and those students would be identified as gifted and talented. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that this is that we're doing that this year to identify students. What I'm saying is that once we have that data, we want to be able to create that as a model so that we can then bring that to leadership and say, here's, here's what these two different models yield in terms of equitable identification of students. So it's an opportunity for us to have data that we can uh, create or kind of create a, a scenario where we can see specifically what would the difference be between our current identification processes and using school-based norms uh, with the COGAT in terms of identifying various student groups for GT participation. Uh, we are also working on uh, establishing a uh, nurturing emergent talent program, uh, which is a revised primary talent uh, development program, uh, primary talent development or PTD was a program that Baltimore County had for uh, approximately two decades uh, that was uh, discontinued about 10 years ago. Um, the program is specifically designed for students in the primary grades, uh, grades K to two or K to three. Uh, and the idea is that it provides students with opportunities to demonstrate critical and creative thinking through non uh, traditionally academic ways. So, for example, um, instead of uh, only looking at more traditional academic measures like writing samples or writing assignments or quantitative reasoning in mathematics or whatever that may be, students are given the opportunity to participate in activities where they can demonstrate critical and creative thinking uh, in non-traditional ways. Um, specific, quick specific example, uh, one of the modules has students, um, the teacher reads to the students uh, the story of the three little pigs, 
uh, the students are then given the opportunity to take materials that the teacher provides, pipe cleaners and straws and popsicle sticks and, and index cards, and they design their own house for the three little pigs. And then they run an experiment to see whether or not their house can stand up to the big bad wolf, which is in this case, a hairdryer. And so it's an opportunity that falls outside of what you might think of as sort of the normal academic activities for students to be able to demonstrate potential um, and uh, we think it's a, a critical piece that we're missing. And then teachers have the opportunity uh, to document those behaviors and that becomes part of ultimately the identification process. Uh, and then lastly, we are continuing to work on curricular revisions and collaboration with the Department of Academics uh, at the elementary level, specifically ELA and math. Uh, but at the secondary level, we're also working with science and social studies and fine arts and CTE. So we are working really with all of the curricular offices in relationship to the curricular offerings that we have uh, for our advanced and gifted learners. And so uh, that concludes my presentation. I want to thank all of you again for the opportunity to be here today. And of course, at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions or um, uh, give you any additional information that I can if you do have questions uh, about uh, what we've just discussed. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, it was very thorough and um, if board members have any questions, just put your name. Um, in the chat so I can make sure that I get to everybody. Um, I can start off with questions. I just have some uh, very basic ones based on mm -hmm. um, the numbers and the information that you gave as far as the <clears throat> ratio and breakdown of our students, the percentage uh, population that they make up at BCPS compared to the percentage that they represent in GT. And mm -hmm. My question would be, um, why do you think there is an over representation? I believe you said it was Asian and white students. Um, why do you think that um, they're, they're the numbers of the representation in GT is so much higher than other students? Well, that is an outstanding question and a very <laughs> difficult one to answer because it's a very it's a very complex problem. Um, that we're facing with with lots of different layers. And so there is no there really is no single answer to that. Um, instead, there are many answers to that question or uh, at least many layers to to answer that question. Um, so uh, we know, uh, for example, that um, certainly there is a, a sense in which bias plays a role in identification. In spite of every effort that school systems make to remove teacher bias from the process of identification, um, that's still a, a piece of the problem that needs to be addressed. And that's where the professional learning work uh, is really critical in the Office of Advanced Academics and the work that uh, Doug, Mr. Handy does with his office. Um, that's where that work uh, really becomes quite critical uh, is um, in working with um, our teachers in order to address those those issues and our staff to address those issues. Uh, so that's certainly a one layer of the problem. Um, a second layer of the problem uh, may have to do with our identification process itself. And so uh, we are constantly trying to fine tune our identification process to make sure that we are eliminating the potential for bias in those processes themselves. So we, we ask questions about, well, what data are we using? Uh, which of the data that we're using is subject to, um, to bias or subject to uh, privileging particular groups over of students over other groups of students. Um, that's one of the reasons why we want to be able to take a look at uh, what would happen if we use COGAT and school-based norms. If we use that as a model for identification, we're very interested to see whether or not that yields significantly different results. We think that it will, but we won't know until we actually have the numbers in front of us and, and we can sort of uh, uh, run that model in order to see. So a second piece of it that we have to own is certainly our own processes and procedures and whether or not, um, in spite of our best efforts and intentions, those processes and procedures may uh, be uh, uh, one of the drivers of the current inequities within the system. Uh, and then there's a much broader question about things like, uh, for example, the curriculum, uh, the written, uh, taught and assessed curriculum. Um, 
is that curriculum meeting the needs of those student groups who are underrepresented in in that GT population? Could it be that part of the problem uh, is that the students in those student groups uh, don't see themselves reflected in the curriculum? And if they don't see themselves reflected in that curriculum, uh, perhaps that has an impact on their um, demonstrated or, or uh, demonstrated maybe the wrong word on their um, uh, on the perception of the adults making decisions about this, it, it may have an impact on their perceptions about those students' potential mm -hmm. and ability and achievement. And so there's a, another layer of complexity there or, or another uh, potential issue there in terms of the curriculum itself and whether or not the curriculum is appropriately engaging and, and uh, appropriately written and taught uh, for the students in those various student groups. Um, and I would just ask though, you mentioned it before, mm -hmm. you said there was yep. a way that we were working to identify gifted and talented students. Um, does that mechanism also take out the um, race factor? Because um, I think you spoke about that a little bit where it just identifies that student and if they're gifted and talented, but is there a way that they can be identified without it being race based, just based off of performance? Um, I'm not sure if I entirely understand your question. Are you asking if we do um, what you might call blind identification where we're unaware of the student's race and we're simply identifying them based on a, a data profile? Is 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 that what based you're asking? Skill, not I guess I don't know what a data profile is, but based on like skill okay. level. OK, uh, sure. So uh, perhaps let me back up for just a moment um, and my apologies. I probably should have explained this. Um, uh, before, let, let me explain uh, in brief our current identification procedures. Uh, we conduct what we call universal screening at the end of grade three, and that's when students are identified in our student information system as gifted and talented. That universal screening process, the, the universal in that universal screening, indicates that we uh, do this for every third grade student. So we don't use a recommendation process where okay. teachers recommend certain students and then those students the teacher recommends are considered for yeah, potentially being identified. Yeah. Right. No, we we um, look at all third grade students and the way that works is there's what's called a review and referral team at each elementary school. And that review and referral team collects data throughout the course of the third grade year and then uh, usually in April of their third grade year. The review and referral team meets and they review that data, uh, what I refer to as a data profile, but they look at each student and they uh, examine all of the data available for that student. And based on that data, they make a recommendation about whether or not that student uh, would be identified as GT in either uh, English language arts, mathematics, or potentially both of those two subjects. Uh, that data includes uh, things like uh, curricular assessments, um, uh, various tasks that are uh, curricular based that students complete throughout the year. So challenge tasks in mathematics and, and tiered tasks uh, in, in third grade math, um, periodic assessments in ELA and so on. Uh, it includes when it's available uh, map score standardized test scores. So the measures of academic progress uh, MCAP um, and this year uh, the COGAT um, results as well. Uh, we have teacher surveys of learner characteristics and parent surveys of learner characteristics um, and and that's we look at all of that data for each student and then make a recommendation. So okay. that is our current process um, in terms of how students are identified. I, I hope that answered your question. If you didn't, please clarify for me. Um, no, no, that's it. You answered it. Thank okay, you. Great. And okay, sure, I just of wanted course. to make note. Um, I didn't know Miss Fass if you saw um, Miss Jost has joined us. Board member Molly Jose. So I just wanted yes, to. Scott, thank you. Yes, and I think um, did you have a question? Uh, not yet. I'm still listening. Okay. So okay, thank you. Okay, and we can go to. Um, thank you for that, Michelle. We can go to Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, my first question is, how was the data measured uh, in the graphs? I know we have the definition of what it means to be GT in the board policy. I'm sure that was incorporated somewhere, but is it one GT class that students are identified as being GT? So it's OK, one GT class. Um, it, it is. Yes, that's exactly correct. So if a student is, for example, if we're talking about, let's say, a middle school student, if they're a, a, 
GT science and standard ELA math and social studies, they are counted in this uh, in this count as a GT student. So that's correct. OK, and so then how are uh, do you have information about the demographics for students that maybe are in all the GT courses compared to those that are uh, in only one GT course? We do not No. OK, um, my second question or some I, I, after uh, was it, is it Dr. Handy or Mr. Handy? I'm sorry, I don't know the, the title. Um, uh, Mr. Handy's fine, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Handy, OK. Yes. You had mentioned those questions that you provided to us. And I, uh, one of them is, are these data aligned with to our student demographics? And mm -hmm. I was just concerned because there was no LGBTQ plus uh, bar in the bar graph. There were no conversations about LGBTQ plus students and uh, how they're incorporated into this data. And I'm wondering, do we have a system of measuring our LGBTQ plus students in BCPS right now? I can take that question. Um, so the the data that you're seeing and the reason why um, you're not seeing that demographic is because it's through our student information system. So there is not a, an indicator in our student information system to pull that data. And that's also why, you know, as uh, Wade had mentioned, you know, we, we can't we can only pull it for who's in one class. You know, because it's checked off. Yes, they're in a class. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. That it's it's not in our student information system. The LGBTQ plus. Okay. Um, I, I just had some questions for understanding, interpreting the data, but I have more questions mm -hmm. later, Ms. Scott. But I, I want to hear some other board members first before I ask those. Thank you both so much for answering. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Thomas. Next is Ms. Mack. Yes, um, I attended a GTCAC meeting where they arranged for a speaker to talk about the identification of giftedness at an early age, and it had a really profound impact on me because there were things that were included that I had never given a thought to, like a child displays a good memory at an early age, a child is good with puzzles, um, a child hits his or her milestones earlier, an increased vocabulary, um, a child who has a great imagination and a child who thinks outside of the box. I know the COGAT is the test and I think Dr. Handy, you, I mean, sorry, Dr. Elmendorf, you mentioned that the teacher does have the ability to look for some of this other stuff. Um, is that what we're planning to do or do we, are we doing that today? And how do we know that teachers are applying those other assessments equitably? So uh, I'll take that question. I, oh, I think sure. what um, with what Wade, Mr. Kearns was explaining before is that yes, we still are going to use a, a multitude of data or observations, um, but as we continue to do that, that's also what's impacting the bias as well, well right so that's there's my like, point that's why i asked the question right there, yeah. there are yeah. um you know it, it's not objective it's still a subjective group of people who are making decisions um but adding the cogat in or examining um looking at school-based norms potentially could eliminate some of that you know, but, but we, we have to explore it and, and see if that works. And, you know, when Wade was explaining earlier about, you know, 10 years ago, we realized there were discrepancies and, you know, we believed we needed to open up access to more students in the race categories that were not represented accurately. Um, yes, that happened, right? We did get more students in the African-American category, but then we like grossly over identified in the white and Asian category. And you saw that in the graph. So, you know, we added more. Yes, we opened up access, but the, the gap is still there. So just to be clear, to, I, I know about the COGA because I attended those meetings where it was discussed, but right now today in the identification of gifted and talented, we are looking at these things like problem solving, um, thinking outside of the box, imagination, mm -hmm. and are yes. teachers provided with guidance on how to do that? Yes, they are. Um, however, as, as Dr. Wistead pointed out, 
uh, that does not eliminate the, and as you mentioned as well, Ms. Mack, that does not uh, eliminate the uh, possibility of bias um, coming into uh, something, uh, a process like that in terms of um, uh, who teachers, uh, you know, how teachers conduct those observations, how they record those observations, their own perceptions of those sorts of things and how they are manifested uh, among their students. Um, and, and so that remains a concern. And as I said, that that continues to be one of the challenges we face in reference to our professional learning. Uh, but those things are included currently in our identification processes through universal screening. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next is Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I know I'm not on the committee, so I appreciate you uh, letting me put in a question. Is there a breakdown of ELS students in the GT category? Did I miss that? Um, have you identified those? Mm -hmm. And also homeless children. And is it um, possible to identify children in the first and second grade that are failing and specifically target them and then see how they do in third grade if they come into this some kind of program like that do we have something and i know i have a third grader that was identified so i'm seeing early reading intervention are we targeting those children that we know are specifically failing in first and second grade and following up on them in third fourth fifth grade did they make gt so i know i asked a lot of questions don't they? <laughs> that's okay, okay. So the, the English learner question, yes, we, we that was on the chart um, and, and they are under identified. Um, homeless students, I, I don't know if we have that category to be able to pull um, that data. So that answers um, those two. And as far as, um, you know, students who are not meeting you know the, the typical milestones and targets or failing you know as you described yes i mean for every student um you know that is our goal to um you know accelerate their learning um you know put them in uh additional scaffolded classes you know to meet those targets but then we don't track that after, I mean, I'm not aware of, anyway, I guess we could ask DRAA, but I'm not aware of us tracking that um, in any way related to GT identification. Mm -hmm. And is that the only grace that GT is picked up at third grade level for fourth grade? Do we identify them in secondary school? And, um, you know, I don't know, I would like to hear um, Teachers take to Miss Best sure if you have any insight of what happens as they go to us, you know, high school. I don't have chat or anything. I can't signal to a soul that I want to come in. <laughs> so <laughs> well, Miss Past sure if I can answer Miss Joseph's question, if you don't mind. Um, and then uh, yeah, <laughs> so Ms. Joseph, in, in response to your question, we conduct universal screening twice, once at the end of third grade to identify students as GT in ELA and or mathematics, and then we conduct universal screening a second time at the end of fifth grade, um, both to sort of, uh, I guess you would say, reevaluate or reassess uh, students. There may be students who uh, were identified in third grade as GT and, and they may they may move out of GT or there might be students who were not identified who move into it. But then in addition to that, in that universal screening in fifth grade, we also identify students as GT in social studies and science. So as they transition from fifth grade to uh, sixth grade in middle school, uh, they uh, may potentially be identified in those four subjects, uh, ELA, math, social studies, and science. Um, and then throughout the course of a student's uh, academic career from third grade all the way on to 12th grade, uh, students uh, may continue to be identified or move into GT programs and services uh, at any point. Um, I should say that the only, uh, it's not really an exception, but but the one uh, course in which that is perhaps uh, there is a greater uh, uh, obstacle in terms of of entering into the GT uh, classes or coursework is in mathematics because of um, mathematics is of such a, a highly sequential nature that if a student is uh, not in a as an example, if a student is not identified as GT math um, as they let's say in sixth grade, um, 
in sixth grade, a GT math student is taking a pre-algebra course. In seventh grade, they take algebra one. In eighth grade, they take geometry. It, it's difficult for a student who was not identified as GT math to move into that course sequence because in essence, it means they need to skip an entire year's worth of math instruction to be able to move into that. And there is an exception um, that, that students can take advantage of uh, because students can take algebra and geometry concurrently. And so even a student in mathematics who wasn't identified early on as GT in math can potentially move into that GT math course sequence when they have the opportunity to take those two courses concurrently. Um, and we do have a, a process in place for students to be able to do that um, if, if that's something that they wish to do. So um, I, I hope that answered your question fully, um, but uh, but there are multiple opportunities throughout and uh, students may enter into the those uh, programs and services at any point. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and it looks like Mr. Handy had a comment and then after him, Ms. Pastor. Mr. Thank Handy, Thank you. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I had to get my camera on and my microphone. I uh, just wanted to um, add a comment around the, the data story uh, that Mr. Kern shared. And I know one of our goals in bringing this to the committee, I uh, certainly want to get some input on how we would move forward considering what Mr. Kearns has shared. So the data story showed, you know, that quantitative data where we are today, and then he talked about using data differently. So I would um, want to make sure that we're getting input from this committee on how we would move forward. So right above my um, re request to make comment, I just added some additional questions to consider. Uh, number one, what are the arguments for and against implementing school-based norms for GT identification in 2022-2023 school year? So Mr. Kearns showed how you know, the, the, the research shows if we go to school based norms, how it could potentially change representation within, you know, student groups. And the second question, what education and information is needed in the broader discussion and communication uh, with stakeholders? So again, just want to make sure we have some information for staff that will help us move forward uh, with input from, from the committee. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, next is Ms. Pastor. Thank you. I was feeling out on that island. I don't know what's wrong with the screen today, but um, we uh, thank you, Mr. Kearns. And I'm going to replay or revisit some of the same questions that I ask and concerns that I have expressed at the GT meetings. Um, one that um, that what we have seen today very uh, good numbers we get to see um, different groups and how they're faring however we know that we know that we get a lot of students who then by the time they get to middle school and particularly high school start to flourish start to grow but the testing will not pick them up so what we what we see continuously in schools is that the children who start out early in GT are the same children we follow all the way to the end in GT, even though there are other children who start to flourish or teachers see um, some aspects of their behavior sometimes. Sometimes it's what they do in classes that say something going on here. Maybe this behavior is tied to the need for more accelerated learning. Not that they're really a discipline problem. Well, they might be, but it's tied to something else. Or we are seeing them even in a math class, because as, as an administrator, I've seen it in cl math classes where there are students who are not necessarily considered, you know, at that fast pace, but something hits them and they're able to do some of the same, come to some of the end, same endpoints that the teacher wants, but not able to follow the same process that they are taught to do. So that they're, what they get is dismissed. So often we are losing children in the upper grades because we're still processing what happened in the lower grades. And I think that sort of goes to what Ms. Joes was asking, but I've seen it time and time again. 
So I want to ask that question first. What are we doing now or on the threshold of doing so that we are not losing those children? Again, I'm moving out of elementary school. I'm moving out of testing. What do we do now so that we know we are capturing those young people who mm -hmm. are showing potential for giftedness? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to extend that even to places beyond the classroom. What other kinds of extracurriculars do we share that might help students grow? Well, Thank Ms. You. Hester, I think, wait, before you comment, I, I also, sure. I, I, I appreciate the comment and I think it plays into something Wade was saying earlier, which is, you know, one of the issues could be is the curriculum that we're presenting and delivering accessible enough to student groups where, you know, then our perception of they're doing well in it, you know, it, it, it goes to that bias. So I think, you know, that your questions draw to that point of like the work that um, schools along with Mr. Handy's team is doing and that culturally relevant pedagogy um, you know, so that's a, a part of it. But Wade, I don't know if you want to say more. Uh, well, just um, that, Ms. Pasture, I absolutely agree with you. I was a, a secondary uh, person my entire career in, in middle schools and high schools. So I am um, I'm right there with you in terms of, you know, experiences over the course of my career in, in working with students. Um, we have put a number of different things across the system in place in order to assist with the identification of students uh, in what we might think of as sort of the later stages of their academic academic career with Baltimore County Public Schools so that even if they were not identified early on uh, in third grade or in fifth grade, uh, there are continued opportunities for, for them to be able to have opportunities to move into those uh, GT and advanced placement courses or uh, or uh, dual enrollment courses at the high school level and so on. Uh, so a number of different things. Number one, I, I have to mention, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Dr. Woolridge's work in college and career readiness. Uh, um, she is amazing and her office is doing incredible work with students uh, through the AVID program uh, and uh, through um, uh, she's um, working, uh, she works with uh, her high school people uh, in particular uh, with using P the PSAT scores as a tool for identifying students for uh, success in advanced placement courses. So the college board has a tool I'm, I'm not, this is terrible, I'm not going to remember the name of it, and I, uh, my apologies for that, but we can find out the name and share it with you if you would like. But the College Board actually has a, a web-based tool that the AP coordinators can go into, and they uh, the tool uh, can predict the um, likelihood of a student's success in an advanced placement course based on their PSAT scores. And so, um, our uh, high school folks use that as a tool to identify students for potential enrollment in advanced placement courses, students who may otherwise have that potential go unrecognized. Um, show uh, what for what any variety of reasons they're not getting good grades or they're maybe there's all sorts of reasons why they that potential may be unrecognized. Um, Erico, so there that, are. Let me just jump in to say, Erica, that goes right to Avid. That's exactly yes. what undergirded the founding and, and the formation of mm -hmm. AVID because those were the C children and maybe even below who weren't, but somebody said, if only, and mm -hmm. then they created that AVID. That's what makes AVID such an important program because it pulls out those students and what it does, and that, and this is the piece that needs to be said, it also offers that social emotional composition because remember any child that didn't get picked up in elementary school by the time they get to high school there's an there's a mental and emotional a baggage that they're carrying it says maybe i can't do it or i don't want to be with these right. students mm -hmm. who've been together since elementary school avid is critical and I can't think of the name either that um, College Board does because they're children who sit in AP classes who had never been identified for GT. It's the AP Potential Program. 
That's what it's called. <laughs> I, it just popped into my head a moment ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. And and I I would mention. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. McComish. Go ahead. Oh no, uh, Mr. Kearns. I just want once you're finished. I know Dr. Holmes has something to add. He he's new to our forum here, and I just want to make sure since we don't have the hand raising function that he had a chance to contribute oh. as well. Thank you. Sure. I just wanted to mention very quickly before Dr. Holmes jumps in that that uh, a piece of the AVID program is that students at the high school level who are participating in the AVID program are uh, required to take at least one AP course during the course of their high school career. And uh, and of course, the AVID program is critical in providing those social emotional supports and academic supports to help those students be successful uh, when they do enroll in advanced placement courses. So I just wanted to mention as part of the reason why the AVID program I think is a great example of something that we do systemically to support uh, students being able to move into those opportunities, even if they haven't been participating in them all along. So I just wanted to mention that real quickly. So I wanted us to be aware of time because we are coming up on our time and I wanted us to make sure we had next steps to go forward on this discussion. Um, Mr. Handy, you were giving us some next steps that we should do. The um, paragraphs that you should send over, um, should is that something that you could email and then we would respond back to it with our suggestions or I guess what are our, what are our next steps um, now that we've spoken about this and gathered all of this information? Sure, Miss Scott, I think in the interest of time, as you stated, I could do that. Uh, make sure you and the other committee members have those questions and um, if you could respond, that'll help inform our next steps as, as staff. That would be great and then board members can um, respond in email. Um, so because we're we are coming up on time. OK, Christian, you have one more question because we're coming up on time. Yes, one question and I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Um, when we talk about reducing the number of uh, students that are being in GT programs, uh, I, I guess I, my concern with that or question with that would be like for those students that when that reduce the number of students that are going on to take algebra going on to take at, at an accelerated rate, then reducing the number of students that are taking AP calculus, AP calculus BC, AP statistics because they're not already in those advanced math courses to be in like a position to take those advanced courses in high school. And so uh, is there a way that that could be prevented while still reducing the number of students in GT courses early on? Um, I, I don't believe so. And and uh, Christian, your point is 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 uh, right to the heart of this question about uh, using school based norms and sort of like how we how we go about this process of of making our identification more equitable according to the definition that we have, which is the ratio of student groups in GT being approximately equal to the ratio of students in the general population. Uh, were we to move to school based norms um, based on COGAT or or whatever we base it on, but but in this scenario based on COGAT, it would absolutely reduce the total number of students participating in GT programs and services, which would have an impact on the total number of students um, uh, moving through that course sequence. So in the math course sequence, as you pointed out, uh, that would result in uh, fewer students potentially uh, taking Calc BC uh, their senior year, uh, which is sort of the current trajectory for uh, many of our, our GT math students. Of course, some GT math students by the time they get to high school, make different choices about what they want to do uh, mathematically, and and so they may not end up in BC anyway. But um, but to your point, it would mean reducing the total number of students who are participating in that in those programs and services. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, I was on mute. I apologize. <laughs> so um, it looks like Dr. Hager had a question. She's on the phone. Um, so um, you can go ahead, Dr. Hager. Yes, I'm sorry for having to call in for this, uh, half of the meeting. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and thank you to my fellow board members for asking awesome questions. Um, I do a lot of work with pipeline programs um, for uh, increasing representation in medicine and science. And we always talk about how important it is to identify kids so early so that they're on a track um, that could lead them in this direction. And so uh, this is such an important conversation. So again, thank you for that. Um, I have a comment and a question. My comment has to do if you wanted feedback on school based norms, I'm honestly very hesitant to go that route. 
just um, this idea of a 15% cutoff in every school. If you think of a kind of sensitivity and specificity of a screening tool, that's going to miss a lot of kids as well. Um, having said that, um, I have had deep concerns about the denominator um, of kids in DT programs uh, since my kids started in elementary school. Um, mm -hmm. So just to give you some context, um, I'm old enough to have gone to school in the 90s in Baltimore County where there were just a few kids identified per school. Um, and then mm -hmm. they were bused to one middle school um, to mm -hmm. be together in a single class. And so when then I learned that in some elementary schools, a third or more of the kids were identified as GT in third grade, I was shocked that that could possibly be the case. Um, so I think that there seems to be other, other ways to handle the denominator issue. Um, and one way that I've been told from folks who work in the school systems is to have some sort of an honors program so that there's another stepping stone so that you're not just jumping to, oh, you're, you know, you're smart, you're gifted and talented, which clearly is, is a much higher um, level than, you know, than a lot of the kids who are, I think, grouped that way. Maybe they aren't specifically likely to truly be in that category of gifted and talented, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes, that makes perfect sense. And, and did you have a question as well? Yeah, so has there ever been a conversation specifically around um, adding a another level um, either mm -hmm. in elementary or middle school as a stepping stone into GT so that you're not just, um, you know, making a decision to, to group a small number of children and then leaving other kids out of a an opportunity to kind of step into a program? So uh, uh, first of all, I very much appreciate your observation and uh, the question uh, based on your observation, I think is an important one. Uh, if we look back historically, um, uh, you were a student in the 90s. I, I was a teacher in the 90s, um, and so I, I remember those those same that same time period uh, that you're you're talking about. And um, there was a time when I uh, first began my teaching career here in Baltimore County Public Schools, where there was an honors program at the uh, middle school level. And so um, uh, that was also a time, though, when when students were um, academically tracked uh, at, at multiple levels. So we actually actually had what we called a, a basic track. Uh, we had a standard track. Uh, we had an honors track and we had a gifted and talented track and students were sorted into all of those different tracks. Um, we did away with that sort of tracking uh, because uh, one of the reasons being that um, uh, it, that we it was predictable uh, who would end up in those various tracks. So, uh, for example, our very small number of students who were identified as GT uh, were predominantly upper middle class white students, and uh, the number of students who were or the students who were identified as basic were often predominantly our African American or students of color. And so there were all sorts of problems with that tracking system. But having said that, um, and with that caveat, I will say that I do believe that one of the historical drivers of this increase in the number of students who are identified as GT uh, was the um, elimination of the honors program at the middle school level. And so students who had previously been in the honors uh, program at the middle school level, um, the majority of those students moved into the GT uh, program. And so um, it, it is one of the systemic decisions that were made long before any of us were in these positions, obviously, but but it was one of the systemic um, drivers, I believe, in terms of um, increasing the number of students in, that are in the gifted and talented program. Whether or not uh, going back to some sort of uh, or some iteration of an honors program um, at the middle school level, whether or not uh, that would um, impact, how that would impact numbers of students identified as GT is, um, is uh, unknowable, although I would make the prediction as uh, clearly you would, that it would likely help to reduce that denominator that we were talking about. Um, however, I would say uh, though that I think all that does is shift our problem um, because, because whether we're talking about uh, inequities in identification for GT, I think if we add honors, we're just going to be talking about inequities in identification for honors. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if it will necessarily solve the issue that we're trying to solve or if it would just um, uh, create a, a, another piece of, an, of that issue that we would have to sort of address or, or figure out. 
So. Thank you. Right. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for that. And it looks like, um, oh, Ms. Mack, there's a question. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on what Mr. Thomas, the question Mr. Thomas just asked. Um, I have a daughter who loves all things math and and when she had an opportunity to fill her schedule, she would fill it with a math class, which is the antithesis of what I would do. But it sounds like in the answer that you gave Mr. Thomas that if my daughter was not identified as gifted and talented, she would not have an opportunity, would not have had because she's 37, an opportunity to avail herself of the math classes that she ended up taking. And she was a BCPS graduate. And when she went to college, her professor said to her, honey, I don't know where you went to school, but you're one of the best math and science prepared mm -hmm. students we've ever had. So can you clarify that if a child is not identified as gifted and talented, he would she, he or she would have a limited opportunity for certain math classes or any classes, I guess, but we're talking about math. Sure, it, I, I would say what I would say and well, in response to Mr. Thomas's question, I was saying that in general, if we were to go to school based norms, then clearly we would be reducing the denominator um, to use the language that we've been using. In other words, the, the raw number of students identified as GT uh, would likely be considerably smaller than 42 percent. Um, so th that would certainly have an impact because it, there would be fewer students who are in that GT program. For any given individual student in terms of how limiting that might be for um, the kinds of courses they would be able to take specifically in the area of mathematics as an example, um, I, I think that that would um, likely depend on the choices that the individual student makes. And what I mean by that is that, uh, remember I said math, and you all know this, math is a highly sequential subject. So you can't just jump from algebra one to, to advanced placement calculus. You've got to uh, have the opportunity to be exposed to those mathematical standards in the intervening courses so that you have the uh, foundational knowledge and skills to be able to move on to that next level of mathematics. There are opportunities currently, and there would continue to be opportunities for students to be able to uh, move through that course sequence at a more rapid pace or take math classes concurrently uh, that would allow them to be able to continue to have those same opportunities. Um, but one of the things that I often share with parents when, when I talk to parents about, uh, particularly about GT math, um, a student who is in GT math, if they follow just the normal GT math course sequence, uh, when they are seniors, they have the opportunity to take Calc BC. If a student were in the um, non-GT course mathematics sequence as a senior, they would have the opportunity to take Calc AB. So in both cases, students at their terminal year with BCPS have the opportunity to take advanced placement calculus. Potentially. Now, again, students have lots of choices and not all students choose that path. But the point is that if that was the path a student chose, both of those two students would have the opportunity to take advanced placement calculus before their their senior year. That's that's pretty high level math. Um, and, and so uh, there are opportunities to have uh, exposure to a really rigorous advanced mathematical content isn't constrained by their participation in gifted and talented, um, it, except in the sense, as I said, that one may up and maybe in Calc BC and the other one in Calc AB, um, but they're both in Calc by the end of their their career. Again, if that's the sequence they choose, uh, many students don't choose that sequence for a whole variety of reasons. They decide they're not going into a mathematical field, their interest lies in other areas, whatever it is. And um, we certainly have GT students who don't take Calc BC because they decide that they want to do something that doesn't involve Calc BC. And, and so they take, you know, they take uh, AP stats or they take, you know, other courses, um, not because they can't take BC, but because they have other priorities. So. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for that explanation. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So now we are over our time, so we'll have to wrap up our discussion Sorry. on that. Um, and Mr. Handy, um, you're going to email those out to us, but thank you. Um, 
all who came and um, Mr. Kearns and, and everybody for um, giving us that that presentation, um, which was very useful. Um, uh, next we have. Thank you very is, much. <laughs> next we have is a discussion um, revisiting the Board of Education um, Equity Council. And so for that, let's see, is that Dr. Yarborough? I'm not sure who's presenting on that. Sure, I can, no problem. Good afternoon, <laughs> or yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we wanted to at this time just revisit the purpose of the Equity Advisory Council. Um, as you see on the slide before you, the council serves as an advisory council to the Board of Ed Equity Committee. The purpose is to provide engagement opportunities for both internal and external stakeholders to discuss systemic equity challenges which are impacted by policy and budget decisions. Next slide, please. Mr. Corn. The school system recommended that the council meet with the with our committee on a semester basis or twice per year. On March 18th, the Board of Ed Equity Committee discussed meeting four times per year and near budget recommendation meetings. It is recommended that this council meet at an agreed upon BCPS school site and or virtually. And so I believe what we are discussing is whether or not the committee would like to move forward with four meetings for this school year. Additionally, in light of our COVID metrics, whether or not we wanted to remain all virtual as opposed to moving to a school site. So I'll open it up to committee member feedback at this time. Um, I can start. I'm fine with meeting four times for this school year and based on the metrics, I'm still being virtual. Is there any thoughts from any others? If, and if everyone is fine with that, um, oh great, okay. Um, then we can go ahead and, and do it. Okay, it looks like there's agreement. And when we say virtual, we mean us and also the people who'd be part of the council. We would all be virtual. Yeah, I think Absolutely. that would be good. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a comment. Yes. Um, well, if we're still meeting in person at, at, during our full board meetings, I, I think it could be, I, I think it might be interesting, like if, metrics that allow for us to meet in person for one of those four meetings to get to meet the people that are on the council to get to have a human interaction with them i don't necessarily think all of them have to be in person but i, I mean, we're expecting our students to go in person and to be meeting every single day in school so i think for uh we should have the same expectation for ourselves and for the uh people well, we're still board. meeting our, our committees we're meeting we're not meeting in person this committee hasn't met in person we're still meeting because this is offshoot of our committee and we're still still meeting virtually. That was why I said we could start. But because we start virtual um, based on metrics and things like that, we could then change like maybe the third or fourth meeting in person. Yeah, I, I like that. Okay. So we will go ahead and schedule the four meetings. The first two will be scheduled for virtual and we'll have an opportunity to reassess if we can go to face to face for the subsequent meetings. That That'd works? be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, and I wanted to know. I didn't know if you all had it yet, um, and maybe it's to discuss at the next meeting. Um, oh, I'm sorry, were you finished with this portion? Yes, yes, thank you. OK, thanks. OK, so now it's a committee discussion. Um, I wanted to find out as far as the sign that we wanted to put up at the front of um, each of the buildings. Um, are we where are we with that and when will be able will we be able to I guess sort of see a mock up that the committee can look at and offer um, input? Yes, yeah, so thank you for bringing that up. Mr. Corns, if you could bring up the graphic now. So one of the things um, that happened after the discussion around uh, cre creating a statement that would be posted in every school is we started thinking about it from an equitable lens and what does that mean for the elementary schools? What does that mean for your pre-K student that was walking through the building? And so um, on the screen in front of you for your consideration and feedback is 
the graphic representation of what equity should look like in every school. And we envision that this is your message that you crafted, translated in a graphic, and it would um, have some attribution to the Board of Education where this would be displayed in every school and every office to, dis uh, to show everyone our commitment to equity and the difference really um, between equity and equality. So you'll see that we um, have gender neutral um, uh, representation. We also show the difference that we are not looking um, in our policies, in our actions, in our deed to make sure that everything is at the same, recognizing that there are different needs um, that our students come to us with. And so we're, we are looking to in action and indeed to make sure that everyone has what they need to be successful. And so that's the other half of the graphic with um, equity and the different things. Um, you know, everything from the foundational resources um, to you know graduation to uh, ideas, creativity, uh, the diploma, um, and of course uh, access to industry and partnerships. And so we wanted to offer this for your feedback. We wanted to know what your thoughts were so we could get back with the um, our graphic designer to um, make any upgrades and changes based on your suggestions in addition to having the actual statement posted, but this one to really capture everyone's attention and quickly demonstrate our commitment to equity. Great. Well, I'll start. I love this. I think it looks really good. And then I like on the side where it has equity, how everybody's hand is touching a different apple. I think that's cool. Um, and you answered my question. I was going to ask about the statement. So it would be like the statement would be here and then the graphic would be here or the graphics here and then the statement like would it be a, a I guess I'm trying to visualize would it be like a large poster or yeah I'm doing a lot of this um like visually what would that look like I'm trying to <laughs> so we could have a poster um we could have a poster and we could do it landscape or we could do it um um portrait uh with the graphic on top and the statement underneath or we can do it side by side we can certainly send both versions to you for um okay. input before we That'd make a final great. decision. Yeah, I'm visual. That would be awesome to look at. Um, it looks like there is a question from Mr. Thomas. Yes, uh, my question refers to the statement. Are we going to review the statement again or in this meeting or just with the review of the graphic? So we were planning to review the graphic in this meeting. The statement was wordsmith. So when we send out the graphic along with Mr. Handy's questions, we can also send um, the statement to you as well. OK, um, are we going to have, have an option to maybe review this statement again or was it a, a statement approved for how it was stated at the last equity committee meeting? So in the last meeting, people provided up, upgrades and suggestions. They were all incorporated. So when it goes out to you along with this document, there still is an opportunity if you want to make any final revision. OK, thank you. Absolutely. Dr. Hager. Hi everyone. Um, I think it looks wonderful and thank you so much for doing this. I would just, uh, the equity and equality words kind of get lost for me um, with the black on the green. So my just personal opinion, I love the idea, everything's great, um, would be maybe to put like a, a white box behind them or something so those words pop out a little bit more. Um, but I, I think the, the actual graphics are fantastic. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, and uh, uh, Mr. Thomas, that's what I was asking. It, they said they were going to do it both like vertical, like you said, landscaped or portrait, so we can kind of see um, which way it, it works. And did I miss anyone? Anyone else have any questions or comments? I would just like to say without seeing it that I think I prefer um, vertical with the with this you guys can't see with this at the top and the words at the bottom because a lot of times people don't t take time to read words but the graphic is a quick way to deliver the message but like we can wait until we see them side by you know different options yeah thank you yeah but i like it miss pastor anything No, I'm fine. I couldn't see the whole thing. I was trying to get the big picture, but now I can see equality and equity at the bottom. But I do agree 
um, on in this regard with Dr. Hager, that equality and equity. Uh, I love it. I, I love this and I love seeing these boxes under them, but equality and equity are our points and they need to be more pronounced, I think. I don't know what that means in terms of where they'd be located, but I'd like to see them bolder or bigger or something. Or like she said, put a white box behind or something just to make them yeah. more well, pop out. Yeah. More. yeah. There's artists who know how to do that. <laughs> graphic designers. <laughs> Excellent. OK, anybody else have any other questions or anything? Because this is I, I really um, think this is awesome. So what our next steps be, um, we'll get the email from Mr. Handy and then we'll get an email with this in a vertical or or, um, or horizontal. And then we'll be send, e send back feedback through email and then when we meet, we'll confirm everything. OK, great. That is correct. Absolutely. Great, that way our meetings can be. Um, and then I guess for um, the last thing is just um, so that we can go forward with the council, um, you know, just identifying and how are we going to let people know that there's the council and because um, basically we're just doing the same thing that we do, you know, with our stakeholders, but just letting them know that, the, that this is the council, this is it, and that we'd like them to be a part of it and then letting them know when our first meeting will be. Is that something your office will handle or how will that work? Yes, we can take care of that as well. OK, that'd be great. And so then at our next meeting, then we'll hear the update on that when the first meeting is, who's in attendance and all of those good things. Correct. OK, is there anything anyone else would like to add to the next meeting? Uh, yes, Ms. Scott. Mm -hmm. um, for the oh, for the next meeting or are we still talking about the graphic? Oh, well, the graphic will be, yes, we will be discussing okay. at the next meeting, but the idea was that when they send it around, we would respond yeah. back through email with any suggested changes. Okay, and then it. they would incorporate it, and then when we have the next meeting, we would see our changes incorporated. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Pastor, did you raise your hand? I did. Um, this isn't necessarily for the next meeting because it will take prep time. But it's so wonderful to have Mr. Handy here, and I'm going to go there, Mr. Handy. Um, because you're here, we're talking about equity. We talked about gifted and talented. Then all of these pieces about which we're speaking go very nicely into the inequity of our um, career technology education program. Uh, the consistency throughout the system. So at some point, Mr. Handy, I would really love to see a presentation on CTE um, for students who live on the west side of Baltimore County and how that meshes with pushing our children forward with GT, success, et cetera, and of course, blueprint for Maryland's future. So I that takes time. I would like for that to be worked on for this equity committee. Thank you. OK. Thank you. OK, so um, if there's, um, is there any further business? OK, hearing none, since we have no further business, then our meeting is now adjourned. I thank everybody for joining us. And I really love this graphics. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All have a good weekend. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Take care. Thank you. Good evening.